All right, welcome again. My name is Paul Ingram, the Director of Growth Management. I'm going to hand it off to our chair in just a second. Before I do that, um, again, I want to thank all the people that have helped put this on, a lot of staff and the panelists that we have here today. I also want to um, acknowledge that the Puget Sound is part of the larger area that is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived here since time immemorial and ceded land under the rest. Um, I often think about how we at PSRC were at, on Western Avenue, downtown Seattle. Uh, we are where the long houses of the indigenous people were um, before uh, the city of Seattle really came about. So it, it really makes me think about um, not only where our offices are, but where this region is. And PSRC welcomes the partnership throughout its approach. Um, with that, um, we want to just talk about our program. If you're here in person, uh, restrooms are down the hallway. Um, hopefully, you're able to find a copy and refreshments. Um, we'll have uh, opening remarks uh, by um, Mark McIntyre here in a minute. Uh, and then a panel will have a break, let you get refilled with coffee of a second panel. Um, and then if you're, for some of us, um, we'll have walking tours in the afternoon. If you're here in person, um, we have, we'll have lunch provided, whether you're staying for the walking tours or that lunch. So that's our program for today. Um, we're recording today's event. Um, if you're here in person, we have a Title VI survey. We'd appreciate you to fill it out or online at the end of the um, event, there will be a Title VI survey. I appreciate There's also AICP credits um, that you can log for this. And if you have any questions, um, please contact TOD at PSRC. And with that, I'll turn it over to David Kilstad um, from County, who's our TOD co chair. Thank you. Good morning, David. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm David Killingstad. I'm the Long Range Planning Manager for Snohomish County Planning Development Services, and I'm one of two co-chairs for the Regional Transit Oriented Development Committee. Uh, Puget Sound Regional Council's Regional TOD Committee works to advance a broad multi-stakeholder coalition to support equitable transit oriented development and the region's adopted growth strategy. Supporting the growth of centers, downtowns, and transit oriented development is vital to the region's strategy for leveraging transit investments, reducing transportation impacts, and meeting our climate goals and building great communities. PSRC and the Regional TOD Committee are proud to host this event that explores the state of the art of TOD and celebrates great local work. We hope you will stay engaged with regional TOD work, keep an eye out for future webinars and other events. With communities coming out of the pandemic and Seattle investing significant energy in revitalizing downtown, this year's event focuses on the recovery and reimagining of downtowns and urban centers. I'm excited to hear from the great lineup of speakers we have today for two panel discussions that will talk about the health and recovery of downtowns from a national and local perspectives. Thank you to all the speakers joining us today and thank you to the PSRC and ULI staff that have worked together to put this event together. Now I'd like to welcome Markham McIntyre, the Seattle Director of Economic Development, to provide today's opening remarks. Thanks, David. Good morning, everybody. A little bit louder. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Uh, I'm very excited about this conference, um, and I really uh, believe that these are the kind of conversations we're having about downtown at this particular moment. So I applaud PSRC for hosting this, thank you very much, um, as well as all of you participating in person and online. It's gonna be a fun day. Uh, I'm Mark McIntyre, I'm the Director of the Office of Economic Development, the City of Seattle. And the mayor tasked my team with developing the Downtown Activation Plan, which is actually known as DAP. Um, and now we're working, as we launched that over the summer, we're now working with other departments, uh, private philanthropic community partners to breathe some life into that. But before I started working at the city, um, I worked at the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, which is our regional business association. So at my core, even though I work at the city of Seattle, at my core, I'm a diehard regionalist. I really believe that the region is the doing a lot of these uh, vexing issues around transportation, housing, infrastructure, what have you. 
Um, and that's how I got my start working with PSRC was at the chamber. Um, so I've known them for a long time and I'm very honored to be here talking to you today and kicking off this conference all about downtown. Um, and that's really why we're all here. I assume that everyone's here because we agree that downtowns are important, particularly at this moment in time as we emerge from the pandemic and try to dream up what's coming next. Um, so I want us all to be thinking big and bold about future of downtowns, both tomorrow, um, as well as 10, 15, 20 years on in the future. I feel lucky because for us in Seattle, the mayor has made this a clear priority, said very uh, openly that he's bullish about downtown, wants to make it um, a priority for his administration now. And that's great for me at the Office of Economic Development, because truly there's no bigger economic development play that we can make right now than getting our downtown humming. It's the heart of our city, of our culture, of entertainment. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the economic center, not just for the city, but for the region and for the state. It's also key to our identity, just who we think of ourselves as Seattleites um, and where we are right now, but also signal for where we're going. Um, and the key thing that I wanna impress upon everyone is what makes downtowns tick is people. Downtowns run on people, which is why our whole Downtown activation plan is focused on how do we get more people downtown, residents, more tourists, more workers, hopefully people that maybe before the pandemic didn't see much going on in downtown for them. Hopefully they see something they want to experience down there, bringing new people to downtown. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not just important for the city. Downtown really is a regional asset. Um, it's a center for jobs, for trade, housing. And because I'm talking to a transit-oriented development group. Yes, a hub for transportation. We've got ferries, we've got trains, we've got buses, we've got freight, all of it moving through this nexus that is downtown. So it's a vital transportation hub. So even though Seattle sometimes um, has its differences with its neighbors, I think we should all be rooting for downtown Seattle to succeed and be a beacon for what the future of downtown can be, both here within the region, within our state, but also across the country. And that was really part of the mayor's message to us as he gave us uh, that task to build the downtown activation plan. Be bold. Don't just come up with a punch list of tactical items. Have a vision, have a point of view about where we're going. Um, so as we built the plan, we did try to strike that balance between addressing immediate emergent issues, but also trying to have some concept for uh, where, where downtown Seattle might be. Going. And that's what the mayor termed, hopefully you've seen it, he termed it space needle thinking. Um, and that was one of my favorite parts about building the plan. Even as we talk to folks who were really frustrated with kind of where downtown is, um, when you started asking them about what their vision for downtown, people just lit up. There was so much energy. So figuring how we capture that energy and really channel it into projects and proposals and is how we're going to actually get from where we are now to somewhere more fun in the future. Uh, as I mentioned, we launched the plan over the summer. We've been building the bicycle as we've been riding it. So we've been filling vacant storefronts for our Seattle Restored Program with young and new entrepreneurs as well as artists. We've been activating public spaces, um, including the Women's World Cup. And if we go to the next slide, I think we've also got pickleball when it shows up. Um, we had a youth basketball tournament and a pickleball tournament where we closed down streets. Um, that was really fun. Pickleball, surprisingly, is a uh, somewhat divisive topic. Some people really love it, some people don't, but we thought it would be fun to close down some streets and play some pickleball. And thousands of people came out. It was a really great uh, it was a great time. You can actually see the mayor there. He's in the kitchen. He had trouble staying out of the kitchen. But it was fun. Uh, we've also made some significant investments into our Metropolitan Improvement District and CID and other areas of downtown for cleaning and beautification. We have the new convention center open, which is super exciting. And that's been a huge draw all summer. We got above 50% return to office. That was the first time we've done that since the, the pandemic. We have a record number of people living downtown, number of residents over 100,000, which is really exciting. Uh, just earlier this week, we also passed some significant pieces of legislation related to gap, including a large up zone along Third Avenue. So those going on the walking tour might go by some of the areas that we're hoping really spur some incredible new residential development along Third Avenue and transform that transit corridor that's been a challenging spot throughout downtown for a long time. And then earlier this week, also the mayor released his budget proposal, which contains $8.6 million for downtown activity. So there's a lot going on right now, but there's a lot to look forward to in the future. 
including we've got a lot of public art that's going to be coming online through our arts department, a lot of murals that are going to be going up. We'll continue our work at the Office of Economic Development to think about how downtown is an incubator for small and diverse businesses, really increase that matchmaking capability between property owners and new entrepreneurs, and get out of just pop-up leases and some longer-term option. We also have a lot more major events coming up. Um, NHL Winter Classic is going to be happening this uh, winter. And then, even though it seems like it's ways away, FIFA World Cup is going to be coming here, which is going to be than any of us can really kind of imagine having the world come to our doorstep, um, as well as the major memorial stadium redevelopment. The council just reaffirmed their that. Um, and then we've got some other major openings. I mentioned the convention center. Next year, there's the aquarium. After that, there's the waterfront. Hopefully, you saw the news about the incredible philanthropic investment to extend the waterfront further north, which I think is just a testament to. If you get the public, private, and philanthropic sector aligned around some of these big ideas, you can unlock new forms of investment in really creative ways. And I, I know I said this already about people, but I don't think we're quite ready for the waterfront. I don't think we fully understand how transformational that's going to be for this city and for this nation. So I'm just super excited about that. So clearly, I could go on and on all day. It's part of my job as Seattle's chief cheerleader or for the region, but for also downtown. Um, so it's no surprise that I'm bullish and optimistic about our future. But I also want to recognize that uh, this is a crux moment for downtowns all across the region. I know that you all read the news. You see the doom loops that get spun up around the death of downtown. But I can only imagine that if you're here today uh, to talk about the future of downtowns, you don't believe it. You believe in the importance of downtowns um, for our region. I also bet that you're keenly aware of some of the challenges, maybe public safety or the uncertain economic headwinds we're getting into, or housing, transportation. Certainly, we've got our share of challenges, but that's the work ahead. That's why I'm excited that you're here today to discuss some of these topics. We need your brains and your energy tuned into thinking about how do we address these challenges? How do we mitigate the risks? How do we take advantage of the opportunities when they arise? So whether you're here in person or participating online, I encourage you to get pumped up. I know it's early on Friday, but bring the energy up um, because you're about to embark on a day of really exciting work um, talking about the future of downtown. I wanna give a shout out to Tracy, who's on the first panel. We worked with Metro, uh, Brookings Metro early on in our plan development. And then I know you've got Lyle from our Office of Planning and Community Development in the second panel, as well as Michelle from Metro, who are partners in all of this work. Um, so you have some really smart people. I think you're gonna have some great conversations. My parting comment to you this morning is to recall that downtown runs on people. So as you're doing, you're dreaming about the future of downtowns, uh, make sure you put people at the center. That's the key that unlocks all of it. So thanks very much for listening. Really appreciate it. And now I'm gonna turn it over to David Lee, going to welcome the first panel. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. Thank you, Markham. I'm Brian Lee. Um, I'm a program manager here at the Puget Sound Regional Council, and I have the pleasure to moderate this first panel. I'm going to keep everything short uh, to maximize the panel's time. Our first panelist, uh, who I hope will be joining me with her video, is Dr. Karen Chappell. Uh, she is the director of the School of Cities and professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. Karen, I believe you'll be sharing your uh, screen, correct? So I'll just go ahead and let you do that. Uh, uh, and I'll pop offline and I'll pop back online when it's close to the next person's time. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much. And thanks so much uh, to um, Puget Sound Regional Council for inviting me. Um, always great to be in Seattle, my uh, sister city to to my hometown of Berkeley. Um, so I, I, I call this presentation the death and life of downtowns, a pun on the Jen, Jane Jacobs death and life um, of great American cities because uh, because there is life after death and and we're seeing it um and um and there are many ways that life is being breathed back into downtowns and i, I think you're seeing some of that with the great work that's going on right now in downtown seattle um 
So death, death and life. So we start with the, the life, um, you know, downtown's come into being in the beginning of the 20th century with the invention of the steel frame skyscraper, and then also the invention of mass transit. And so suddenly you can support incredible um, employment densities in downtown areas. And that uh, brings the historic downtown office district to life in a number of different uh, North American cities. Um, now, when there's disasters, these uh, these places seem to bounce back. And I mean, lower Manhattan bounced back many, many times. Um, one thing that cities have had to weather, however, um, is is the highway um, um, and the Interstate Highway Act. And um, cities have face this in different ways. Um, this is an older picture of the West Side Highway on, in Manhattan. Um, and uh, of course, the New York City had the forethought for various reasons um, to tear that down um, and have an at-grade boulevard. And now, of course, Seattle um, is also doing the same. So it's, it's that this is one factor that I think kind of hinders the the comeback of of cities uh, today is the the cities that that haven't uh, taken down that highway and this is Toronto on the right which has uh, continues to embrace its waterfront highway um, much to my chagrin um, you know Europe actually spared its cities that highway. Um, and by by using the peripheral road for in most European cities, and I'll show you when I talk about European city recovery in a moment, um, what effect that that actually uh, had, or it, it's part of the the reason that European cities bounce back much more quickly. So let's talk about uh, the death of downtown from COVID and the data that we have on on it. Um, and see what has actually happened. And this I'm drawing here from our website, downtown recovery com. Um, the funny thing is, is that about a year and a half ago, we started this research um, using cell phone data to track activity patterns, to track recovery across downtowns. And I thought, well, I should buy this URL um, just so we can put our work up online. Downtown recovery com, um, $3, bought it for $3, really great bargain. It's actually now worth $1,500. Um, so, um, clearly, uh, people care about it a lot more now than and they didn't realize how important it would become two years ago. So what we're doing in our downtown recovery research is we're looking at um, where uh, people stop. Um, in, in cities, and they're typically um, places of interest that people stop. And what we do is we track activity over time and see um, how many people are stopping in downtowns. Um, and uh, we use a couple different data sets to do that. Um, I could talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but just to give you a sense of where people are stopping, they're stopping all over the place. They're stopping at the dog park. They're stopping at the church. They're stopping at the library. They're stopping at the, at, at the um, Dunkin' Donuts and so forth. Um, and this is what it looks like in in the Toronto context where where all the stops are and um, um, uh, concentration, of course, on the corridors um, and, and in, in the downtown area. Um, what we do is we've compared um, the 63 of the largest uh, downtowns in North America, and we've uh, devised an, a kind of apples to apples definition based on postal codes and zip codes, um, and that's really rooted in employment density. So we identify the, the dense employment core of, of uh, these cities um, and then look at activity in them. Um, how does that, what does that look like? Um, well, again, we have uh, very different types of uh, downtowns, but we, we define concentric areas. Um, Manhattan, of course, there's two, uh, uh, Midtown and Downtown. And I just throw Rome in here for just a little bit of a comparison uh, because um, Rome and the other European cities um, that we look at, um, they're, downtown is not a central office district it is a cultural district and it tends to be um uh have very different uh parameters from um from the u.s downtowns and that's meant a lot for their recovery so just to give you a visualization of what phone data downtown looks like this is toronto um this is uh the red is where the downtowns are um, this is the type of activity we had before the pandemic. Um, this was when the pandemic hit. So again, before the pandemic, activity from cell phones looks like this. Pandemic hits, um, suddenly downtown is way down. And then as the pandemic eases, you see 
some return back downtown, but what should stand out to you here is actually that there's a lot of activity outside of the downtowns. And this is what we have seen in uh, city after city. So in our work, we look at what we call the recovery rate. We're comparing the number of visits to downtown in 2023 um, to the, the number in, in 2019. So it's a percent. Um, and then we rank the cities. Um, and uh, this is this is our latest reconfigured uh, ranking. Um, it goes through June. Um, it ranges. And, and so there were there were uh, a couple lessons that kind of stand out here. Um, number one um, is that there's a great diversity of outcomes. And so right now we're seeing recovery rates of downtown areas from anything uh, a, a low of four, 50, about 50% 50 in Portland um, to uh, a high uh, of uh, well over 100% in, in some of the southwestern cities like Las Vegas and uh, um, uh, San Jose and so forth. Uh, here's Seattle. Um, so Seattle, we have at about, uh, I think it's about 70% in our last uh, ranking. It's, it's, um, it's, it's coming, it's coming back slowly. Um, but what should um, stand out here is that the regions are performing really, really differently. So Seattle is in this dark green, a number of the different West Coast cities are in this dark green, the Pacific uh, cities. Um, there's just a bunch that are really struggling. Um, and there's a few that are doing super well, um, like San Diego um, in Southern California, but those are almost um, more like the Southwestern cities which are in yellow, which are really the star cities here of the story um, coming back, um, the southwestern uh, cities, um, along with some of the southeastern cities seem to really be leading the charge uh, back uh, in recovery. Um, Again, the European comparison, this is actually from uh, um, about six months ago, but I um, put it in here just to show you the dramatic difference between a San Francisco and a Barcelona, which are actually sister cities, and yet their recovery is entirely different. Um, why? Um, because a place like Barcelona, a place like Berlin, Madrid, they didn't have a dedicated single-use office district um, the way that many of the older American uh, downtowns uh, did like San Francisco, like Seattle, like Boston, like New York. Um, and so they have been able to bounce back because they said early on, our center is going to be a cultural and historical center. It's not going to be about office employment. It's a different model. Um, just to one other point on, um, on recovery rates within a metro, um, this is a neighborhood commercial district districts in Toronto, um, and the ones in red are, are the ones that are suffering, that haven't come back. The ones in blue have bounced back or come roaring back. And so you see that many neighborhood commercial districts are doing super well. Um, downtown um, is not doing as well. That's that big red uh, uh, blob at the south of the of the diagram is the financial district um, in, in, in the city of Toronto. Um, so we tried to explain what was going on, um, to, to explain this diversity in outcomes. So we threw a whole bunch of variables into a model, about 50 of them, 50 variables representing demographic, e economic characteristics, density, um, and a number of factors like the weather, um, like how strict were lockdown regulations, um, and so forth. Um, this is the results of our analysis of the factors that matter um, thrown into a random forest classification model. Um, and so just to orient you to this chart, red means the factor is bad. It has a negative impact. The bigger the bar, the more the negative impact. Green is means the factor is positive. It helped cities come back. Um, so the the most negative factor on the top of this chart is employment density. High employment densities are apparently uh, uh, correlated with, um, with low recovery rates. Um, on the other hand, uh, having a lot of people that drive to work means a higher recovery rate. Um, the bulk of these variables though that matter um, in this is a long, long list, um, but if you look at kind of the top 20, what really matters, it's the economy. So it, if you have an over-concentration in professional services, if you have an over-concentration in information um, or um, 
or in finance, um, you're not doing so well. And that's part of Seattle's story. Um, I mean, Seattle's one of the hottest tech centers, so is San Francisco, and, and those are the folks that decided to go home uh, to work. And then there's also a, an extreme concentration of professional service workers. These are lawyers, these are accountants, these are management consultants, these are advertising firms. And, and many of these are small firms. They're, they've decided to basically work from home. Um, they're not going back to their older, um, space in, the, in in class B and class C buildings, often uh, you know above storefronts and and so forth, or just o older uh, high rise towers. They're not going to go back. Uh, they're small firms. They have the choice uh, to stay home. So that it turns out that reliance on on that kind of professional class of of industries is is um, serving downtowns uh, poorly. The ones that had that over concentration, like Seattle, um, like San Francisco, like New York. Um, and so just to see some of the correlations, how they play out, negative factors, again, information, financial insurance, uh, insurance these are negative correlations, but good, good um, uh, sectors to be in, um, uh, healthcare, education, um, government, um, manufacturing, transportation. So these are kind of bread and butter sectors that are powering through uh, downtown. So sometimes it's the unsexy sectors um, in a diverse economy that, that make you more resilient. And that's what's going on uh, right now. Um, so I'll very briefly say other other um, researchers uh, agree that downtowns are coming back and can come back. Um, this is some research showing how high productivity firms cluster and they need to be nearby to be productive. Um, so uh, they have to agglomerate. Um, this is another uh, um, study that looked at the rent gate gradient before and after COVID and found that, um, you know what, it's still more expensive to be downtown than it is anywhere else. So downtown still matter. Um, this is the work, uh, uh, you know, a number of different um, people have been working on, on what are the implications for the office market. I hardly recommend this work uh, by, um, by uh, Professor Gupta at NYU, the paper's available, um, but very, he's the one that's sort of looking at what, how is this going to play out? When are the commercial leases um, going going to come up for renewal. Um, there's still about 60% of them that have yet to come up for renewal. And so this is going to play out over a long uh, time frame. Um, he also looks at the switch to kind of um, to shorter term leases from longer term recent leases. So people have um, are less committed to downtown than they were. Um, and then um, then there's also uh, a, what they call the flight to quality. So the flight to A plus and, and class A buildings um, and the and the um, unpopularity of class B and class B C space. So just to wrap up, a couple of policy implications, you know, obviously we want to keep our places active. We want to make sure we have activity across public and private spaces. Um, people, um, you know, talk about this in terms of uh, the 15 minute city and you know certainly there's districts in Seattle which um, are are very lively and and have all the characteristics of Paris this is just not a uh, possible everywhere um uh, however so um so and in fact in a place like um, San Francisco I would argue that that kind of tactical urbanism is just not going to be enough you really have to look inside the buildings you really have to look at the sectors that are there and think about who wants to be in that place um, nine to five who can we get back in that in that time period um, so we're gonna need to, we should keep our um, businesses alive we're seeing a lot of businesses go out right now they made it through the pandemic through the PPP they're now suffering um, we're gonna have to kind of help those businesses weather this uh, hard time period um, and we're gonna need to tolerate work from home because it's not changing anytime soon. Um, and then long term, we're going to just have to think about diversifying downtown economies, diversifying land uses, making 24-7 uh, areas, just realizing that the office district idea is obsolete and we really need to, to, to rethink those uh, spaces. Um, and when, let's, when we're rethinking them, let's make sure they stay uh, inclusive and affordable so that um, uh, low-income workers can, can, uh, can get to their jobs, can live near their jobs and so forth.
Um, and then, of course, we, we will probably need to double down on transit uh, and walkability because, again, those have a premium. People want transportation choice, um, and that's that's going to help bring bring the downtown back. Downtown is for people. Jane Jacobs wrote that in 1957. She was right. We still haven't gotten the lesson. We've we've got to listen to her. She was a pretty smart lady. Um, and this is just an example of a city that did kind of get it right, which is San Diego always leads the charts for us in terms of recovery. Um, lots of mixed uses downtown, uh, lots of reasons to be downtown, not just nine to five, but but in the evening um, and the and the weekends uh, as well. Also benefits from great weather. So with that, I'll I'll end it and hand it over to Tracy. Thank you, Karen. That was great. And we're slightly ahead of schedule, which I think will allow us for some interesting discussions at the end. So um, as Karen mentioned, uh, our next speaker, next panelist is Dr. Tracy Hayden Law. She is a fellow with the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking uh, with Brookings Metro at the Brookings Institute. Tracy, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. I am really looking forward to uh, being in conversation with my fellow panelists on this topic. So I too am going to try to do a shorter presentation, but let's see if I can get what I have to share up. Okay, how's that? Can people see my slides? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so the theme of this panel is data and what we can learn from it about what downtowns are going through. And so I'm just going to share some of the analyses that I've been doing over the last couple of years. So uh, I assume that everyone in this audience has heard about the doom loop and how cities are over. But what I want to emphasize is that this is really not just about the impact of COVID. Right. While the pandemic has shifted demand across places and some of those shifts will be long term, there's also um, the resulting economic evolution that's happening because of that, that is actually benefiting uh, some people in places while hurting others. Um, something that's been going on at the same time as the disruption of COVID is the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement that's grown into a widespread call for progress on racial justice that is something that cities and regions need to take into account as they think about what recovery means for their downtown and why we have downtowns and who they're for. And then at the same time, climate change related disasters are escalating in cost and impact on the built environment which is going to have an impact on many downtowns. So this convergence is a lot going on at the same time, which makes it hard to wrap one's head around what it's gonna to take to reset and reimagine. I totally agree with Karen that we're gonna be, we need to continue emphasizing the need for creating more walkable transit oriented mixed income communities um, maybe where we start to disagree a little is that I still think there is a very strong economic fundamental for those to be anchored by quality jobs in opportunity industries. There are widespread benefits to creating such communities, and there's a huge role for public policy in creating more connected, inclusive, vibrant communities. So that's you know, what I, I hope everyone takes away from the data that I am going to share today. Because a big problem I think we have in the policy space right now is that um, there are, we're all having a lot of really strong reactions to the disruptions of the last few years. And not all of those, the headlines that you saw on the previous slide, those headlines, they have statistics in them but that doesn't mean they're based on facts. And so um, we have a struggle to understand what is really going on and what we should really do about it. And I and hopefully data can help. I hope that I still have a, a semi-useful job. So here's what I'll talk about today, that downtowns do have a vibrant future, but that because the pace of economic and social change is faster than ever, our built environment and our civic structures and institutions 
have to get better about adapting. Let's talk first about what's going on in terms of economic change. Already prior to the pandemic, downtowns are no longer the only place where activity clusters. A majority of US metropolitan population and jobs are suburbanized. And what we have now is a constellation of activity centers, both adjacent to and suburban from historic downtowns. These activity centers are emerging to meet the continuing and real and frankly growing demand for density that the agglomeration that Karen was talking about in her presentation. So it's not just that everything is spread out everywhere and place no longer matters. It's that um, place matters in a different way than it has historically. So I just want you to take my word for it that I did a whole bunch of math in order to prove this. And I wrote up the math in a giant report that you can check out. Basically, we did a big project here at Brookings where we looked at the top 100 metropolitan areas in the United States. And we combined a bunch of public and private data sets in order to look at what the economic geography of U.S. regions is like. And what we found is that across U.S. regions, this activity center pattern is strongly emerging. So here's an example of what we found when we did the math. Um, here you see some of the fastest growing neighborhoods in the Seattle metro area and some of the fastest growing cities in Washington state, which includes both Seattle and other size cities. We see areas that have long been centers of economic activity like downtown Seattle, um, but we also see places that aren't always named as peers or competitors to the big downtown like Kent. And I also wanna acknowledge here that the Puget Sound Regional Council has long been a leader in understanding this modern economic geography and incorporating activity centers as a framework for planning. I am late to their party. I am simply honored to be allowed to hang out. Thanks for having me. And please don't confuse my activity center maps that I'm showing here with the Puget Sound Regional Councils. So one thing that we learned at Brookings from this mapping exercise is that even today, downtowns are still uniquely important to regional economies. For all of the top 45 US downtowns, the downtown activity center concentrates more jobs than other regional activity centers by a factor ranging from a low of 1.4 in Birmingham, Alabama to a high of 27.5 in Chicago, Illinois. That means that with very few exceptions, even if 50% of jobs it, that, were, that were in US downtowns prior to the pandemic, if half those jobs like became fully remote and like never came back, but 100% of jobs came back in other job centers, and this is like, I'm posing like a very extreme hypothetical here, that's definitely not what's happening. But even if that did happen, downtowns would still be the densest job centers in their relative regions. That means that their well being matters to the whole economy. And downtowns also matter to their cities because even with hybrid work here to stay, the suburban commuter workforce is a big part of how the average city's daytime population and thus their market for goods and services becomes more dense during the day by an average of 19%. And in a few notable cases, that boost is 50% or more. So if you're in Washington, DC or Boston, Massachusetts or Hartford, Connecticut, these cities have much, much higher daytime populations. And so they're thinking not just about the impact on jobs, but the impact on sales taxes. So the issue here is that there's limited political appetite for the kind of reinvestment in downtowns that happened in the 2000s. Right? What about all the space on this map that's showing up as blank? That's like where the voters are. <laughs> They're spending more time in their own neighborhoods than ever. And that's where they'd like to see prioritization and investment. And that makes sense when you think about it, because where different kinds of regional activity centers are 
has been shaped by patterns of segregation and disinvestment. It's not just luck that determines who gets to live near an opportunity-rich activity center. So that kind of segregation and inequality that I just talked about, it leads people to conclude that modern city politics is downtown versus neighborhoods. However, I think if we look at the data, we see that there's a different story. Activity centers are the fiscal foundation that jurisdictions are built on. They generate a steeply disproportionate amount of taxable value relative to their size that pays for infrastructure and services for everyone. If that subsequent spending and investment is inequitable, that's a problem. But downtowns are part of the solution, not the cause. I will also pause here to note that I'm showing this figure because I think it helps us think about the fiscal impact of remote work for cities beyond commercial real estate. Outside of the Rust Belt, there's a positive association between higher home values and proximity to activity centers. Because activity centers have jobs, but also because they have all kinds of other fun things like downtown San Diego that people want. Right, because most sectors of the economy and also like most workers are not going to be fully remote. That means proximity to jobs and all the other good things of life will continue to matter. And cities still, their fundamental value proposition and their competitive advantage is offering low travel times in the form of housing in proximity to activities, including jobs. Since the residential tax base is larger than the commercial tax base in most cities, it is fiscally critical that cities protect their tax base by continuing to maintain vibrant activity centers. Housing near jobs, it's also good for the environment. What activity centers do is bring a lot of destinations into very close proximity, and that changes people's travel behavior. So this is critical to getting out of traffic and meeting our climate goals. And as Karen already said, jobs near jobs is good for the economy. So in our own research here at Brookings, we have also demonstrated as other researchers have that job concentration is still important even as the remote work experiment goes on. We found that metro areas with more job density in their activity centers have significantly higher productivity at a metro area level. Look at Seattle blasting out the pop chart here. This correlation between job proximity and productivity is stronger than the analogous bivariate correlation for educational attainment of the regional workforce or industrial composition of a region's economy. In other words, if you want to boost productivity, the secret isn't everybody's got to go to college or I need to attract a lot of tech jobs to my city. It's just put jobs near other jobs. That's what boosts productivity. Okay, so now I'm going to run through a few more data angles to think about as we understand the present challenges of downtowns and other activity centers. First, the need to understand adaptive reuse and resilience. It matters right now, just that downtowns are the oldest activity centers. They have already reinvented themselves many times, as Karen said, but in the present moment, they are struggling with how our built environment has become less flexible over time. It's hard and expensive to convert a modern high rise into something else. So downtowns are at a competitive disadvantage relative to other literally newer activity centers because the product mix needs to change. So this is part of the challenge that's going on right now. It's not that offices are over, it's that offices are changing and we need to offer them flexibility in how they're changing. And there's a big fight about who's gonna pay for it. Second, crime. Downtowns have experienced significant disruptions since the pandemic that have made workers, visitors, and residents feel uneasy. In interviews that myself and my colleague Hannah Love conducted across four U.S. downtowns in the fall of 22, we heard a lot about how the increased visibility of public drug use, high-profile violent crime, vacant storefronts, emptier streets, and harassment was making people feel 
as though their cities were in disarray and the government wasn't doing much about it. I want to pause here and note for a second that residents in some urban neighborhoods have felt that way for a long time. And so it's actually, it can actually be like kind of offensive when it's like suddenly breaking news that um, public safety is an issue downtown when it's been a persistent issue in some neighborhoods for a long time. And so I think we need to unpack carefully how to respond to this. What we see in this figure is that it's very true that crime as a whole in the United States is way up. It's up everywhere and not just in cities. There are very different spatial patterns in terms of how the increase in crime nationwide is distributed. And what this figure shows is that the vast majority of city crime happens outside of downtowns. That's that's what this figure shows, right? That like the, the highest crime share here, 32%, that means that 68% of crime is happening, of city crime is happening outside of the downtown. But we see a couple different things here that can help us understand why the crime vibe with downtowns feels so strong right now. So first of all, it is wild that 30% of all of the crime in Seattle happens downtown. That's a very high concentration that's clearly different from other downtowns. And it's something that's good. Seattle is like looking at this and working hard to understand it. And second, for a city like New York that has a super duper safe downtown, there was a two percentage point increase in crime downtown between 2019 and 2022 in Manhattan. So in other words, 90% of crime is still happening outside of downtown, very disproportionately safe. But a two percentage point increase when you start at 8% is a 20% increase from the baseline, right? So depending on how I say that, right? Like 2% or 20%, like one of those sounds incredibly scary. And so I hope this helps understand like why some of the rhetoric out there is the way it is. Everyone deserves to feel and be safe, but we need to understand when we need to respond to a perception with reassurance and when we need to respond to a reality with public safety resources. That's what we need to do if we wanna make policies that will actually make us safer. Here's another look at some data to help explain why transit systems have been hit so hard in particular by the pandemic. In high ridership metro areas, work trips are drastically overrepresented in the transit trip purpose spread. That's what this graph is showing, that on the x-axis, as the share of metro area trips made via transit gets higher, on the y-axis, we see an increase in the share of, of trips that are for the purpose of going to or from work. But the vast majority of travel in the US is not related to getting to, it's not related to getting to or from work. The 2017 National Household Travel Survey found that only 23% of trips are commutes. So that means that since the vast majority of travel is non-work travel, it's a problem that it was double or close to triple that on major transit systems prior to the pandemic. Commuting is decreasing. But what we're seeing is that post-COVID, demand for mobility is stronger than ever. It's not that everyone is staying at home. People are making more, shorter trips. So that means that investing in walking, biking, and bus transit makes more sense than ever. We have to adapt to this changing travel reality. On to the next topic, which is homelessness. This is a huge problem and it's a hard one to solve primarily because the cause of homelessness is regional housing costs, which is why if you don't even read the actual title of this table, it just looks like a list of places with expensive housing. But the pain is not experienced equally by everyone in the region that's part of the problem. It's obviously hardest on the people actually going through it, but then there's also a concentrated impact on downtowns, which is where people experiencing homelessness are naturally drawn because they are in profound need of the benefits of proximity that downtowns provide, the access to information, safety, and human connection that's found in downtowns. I'm sprinting on top of a lot of issues in this talk. So I just wanna say that what I want you to take away from seeing this table 
is that this kind of huge variation in homelessness rates suggests that there is more we can do about homelessness than just address the cost of housing. We gotta do that. But homelessness is not like a permanent feature of urban life that's hopeless. And so if we acknowledge that there are out there policies and practices that work, that means that the list of metro areas doing the best on homelessness is not just like a list of the places that are the richest or have the cheapest housing. This is not just a cost and money problem. I hear a lot of finger pointing, shrugging, excuses, frustration, impulsive policymaking in this area. And we just need to be better than that. That's what, the, that's what I see in the data. So it's been fun seeing Karen's work on downtown visitation really take off. And I'll just add to what she's done by asking one last question with one last date element. Who is downtown for? The downtownrecovery.com metric is based on unique visits. And so that does capture changes in office utilization on a daily, weekly, and seasonal basis. But it's also sensitive to jobs shifting from in-person office work to fully remote work or trips downtown taken for a casual business purpose. Like this, the question is not whether your lawyer is going downtown and using their office. The que question is whether you are going downtown to see your lawyer. Like, does that office just have one person in it now? Whereas all day it used to have like two, a rotating cast of two. So it's also sensitive to jobs relocating outside of downtown, of course, right? Like either work from home or changes in job location and changes in tourism and other non-work travel. So I want to talk about these changes in casual business travel and tourist travel in particular, because that's the bingo, right? Look at this graph from a different cell phone data set than the one Karen uses, but it gives us some granularity in terms of exploring what we can learn from these data sets. This shows foot traffic in downtown Tampa, but I've seen this same graph for downtown Philadelphia and it shows the same thing. Both before the pandemic and in recovery, the single biggest share of downtown foot traffic in a downtown is casual visitors. Whether that's you going to your lawyer's office or an international tourist. The visitor category is huge. And so we need to understand more about what's in there. This is also locals catching the game. But I think we're really underestimating the importance of non-routine, right? Casual visitation in understanding urban vitality. But if a huge piece of what's driving the cell phone data insights is this casual visitation, is this the definitive measure that we want to use for understanding urban vitality and for defining recovery and what it would mean for a downtown to recover? This is the kind of question that I think places need to be asking and answering. And with that, let's get into some discussion. Thank you, Tracy. Um, we have one more panelist, and she is actually uh, in person. But before I introduce her, I just have one uh, public service announcement. Uh, my spies who are uh, in the room in person tells me that people are very interested, uh, particularly taking pictures. Just want to let everybody know that the presentations, uh, the slides being used will be made available. They'll be posted um, I believe after the morning sessions are over. So they should be available as soon as this afternoon. So you should be able to sit back and enjoy the show without trying to take pictures and know that you would be able to download the presentations afterwards. Um, I believe they'll be uh, on our webpage for this event under event uh, resources. And um, I, I think we should be able to send out the link to that. All right, so uh, last but not least, we have one more presenter. We have Dr. Cynthia Chen, uh, who is in person um, in the boardroom there. She is the Director of the Transportation, Human Interaction and Network Knowledge Think Lab. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Washington. Cynthia, uh, would you like to kick it off? Thank you, yes. Uh huh. Thank you for inviting me, and I was really honored. And this work um, um, actually is the product of, of course, my awesome students that I list there, as well as Brian Lee and other 
a few others that here are seized, uh, children, and Joanne Lee, uh, who also actually came from my lab. And so my, um, different from the other two speakers and uh, my uh, talk, we really zoom in this region in particular, and also using the data collected in the PSR as well. Outline and parsing. And so, what really motivated us, well, by the way, actually, uh, yesterday Brian commented, this is too academic. So, I guess I try to defy today with my presentation is try to not to do this academic with a set of academic slides. And so, <laughs> and so anyway, so the motivation is really coming back from. Um, 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 Hedgestrand's uh, space time prism uh, decades ago, I think in 1970, he published a paper in Journal of Regional Science and said, what about people in regional science? So the idea is that looking, I portray this one person's uh, hypothetical travel trajectory in 3D format, time and space. And what he's basically saying that we have anchor points like home and a work, and everything else, sort of maintenance and discretionary activities, sort of surrounding about that. And so, what motivated this work is that with COVID and telecommuting, so you have workplace and anchor point removed. So, how do people really reschedule those uh, shopping, and, uh, going to lunch, and those other activities along? So, that was kind of motivating. Um, so a little bit of terminology done by my students. And uh, so we have uh, mandatory trips and what I speak about, and these are really four kinds of trips. And so uh, home to work, home and work to work, and home to home. And home to home are really referring to people with multiple home locations. Um, and, and then versus maintenance and discretionary trips. And so they are shopping, going to and banking, recreational, or, or escorting, picking up and dropping off. So, um, and so we also look at trip training because one of the uh, hypotheses is that um, that how the trip, you know, how the training, the trip, uh, trip uh, activities might have changed, and that do have potential VMT conse consequences. And so, um, so we have. Look at simple chip chains, so for example, going from home to a store and a back home versus a more complex uh, chip chains, like uh, from home to work and lunch, back to work, and then back to home, for example. So, and the hypothesis is that more complex chip chains are probably uh, more often for uh, the pandemic. And so, set of questions that um, that we try to answer with this work surround around four different categories. So one is the generation of trips, right? And so, uh, people do not have to go to work. Do they simply forgo those trips that are previously associated with the workplace? Um, or they try to reschedule. And if they try to reschedule, and how do they reschedule? And so we look at Spatially, that uh, are they now clustered around home and has um, uh, a person's foot point for the activity space has changed or not? And how about your training? And on the temporal distribution, that we are looking at you know, how, for example, uh, the peaks have changed, how the morning and uh, evening peaks have changed. And of course, we're also interested in looking at the mode of transportation used and the vehicle. Has traveled uh, associated this sort of center, and again, that we use the data sets collected in this region. By the way, I think a lot of us in academia always want to thank folks at PRSC because the PRSC data set, household travel uh, survey data set, dating back, I think, in the 1980s, have generated many, many, pictures, and including some of mine. You know, so, so we thank you for that, and so, and also shows how valuable the data collection effort at PSRC is, not only for this region, but also internationally. 
And so uh, for this audience, I don't have to, um, I guess, spears that get us sad. And um, essentially, we use multiple waves, 2017, 2019, which is sort of the basis for pre-pandemic, 2021 for telecommuters and post-pandemic comparison. Um, so this is also uh, app credit and this is credit coming from PSRC. I don't want to pass that. And so the methodology we use is what we uh, what um, called propensity score matching. And so the idea is essentially try to match a sample from the 2017 and 2019 sample, which is more sort of a computer sample, versus the um, 2021 sample which we kind of dub as telecommuters and using a set of covariates. So the idea is that, you know, let's look, uh, compare the activity and travel patterns between these samples, given after matching that their other social demographics and environment characteristics will be similar. We don't have to worry about confounding factors, social demographics, or um, where they live. So that's, idea. It's a little bit of our way of easing out uh, co uh, causality from correlation. And so I'm going to pass that. So, um, again, and so again, I said the matching uh, method is essentially match a telecommuter to a commuter uh, that is closest. So and closest measure really the difference in measured by a probability from the logistic regression that we have. And so uh, in the end, that the two samples should be fairly similar multiple characteristics. So this is a balance check between the commuter sample and the telecommuter sample and on a number of uh, uh, social demographic characteristics like income, cultural size, as well as real environment characteristics like access to jobs, population density, and access to the market look pretty similar. Um, so this is also a set of statistics, which also look pretty similar between the two sets, a past set, the results section. And so on the first section, on trip operation, and we ask you, know, you telecommuters take fewer number of maintenance discretionary trips, and do they also make, you know, change fewer number of trips? So you can see from the number that overall that the telecommuters make actually fewer number of trips overall on a day, but actually they make more non-mandatory or maintenance and discretionary kind of trips. So which include shopping and uh, eating meals. Um, also, as, as we expected that they make more simple trips right? so from home, do something in the back home, um, as opposed to chaining different trips together. And so this is uh, also, we look at different purposes, right? And do computers complete trips for different purposes now? And so definitely home-related activities, much less work, more shopping, social uh, recreation, and errands. And these are the uh, trip purposes used by peers actually, and uh, that work really uh, similar amount of escorting activities, which is similar, because escorting activities are very much related. And uh, a little bit of, well, so, and also overall, the trip purposes are less diverse. <clears throat> so um, this is, uh, we look at temporal scheduling, so we look at, okay, how, uh, since the telecommuters are less constrained and um, how the, their departure times for these different kinds of trips are spread out. And so I guess one thing you can see is that the morning peak is muted now and the evening is still sent out, but there's a pretty pronounced day peak as well, uh, which is not so much um, in the, pre-pandemic <laughs> And the next one is we look at just mandatory trips, and these are, again, related and work-related trips. So you can see, again, that the peaks 
two peaks uh, down, and they are flattened. And we also look at temporal distribution for those non-mandatory trips as well. And you can see that um, the the midday peak is still there. The morning peak kind of disappear, and the evening peak is there as well, a little bit less so than uh, pre-pandemic. And we drill in a little bit further, looking at um, non-mandatory trips, uh, big options, and shopping, um, social recreational meetings, escort, other, other primarily personal business and medical appointments. So that, for example, that overall, the peaks are flattened, right? And the morning there. <clears throat> um, well, for the shopping, I think there's more people move, I mean, people uh, seem to shop more during the day because the morning, I mean, the evening, even if it's down, and social recreation as well, to this kind of moving, doing more of those activities during the day. Um, here, the the midday uh, sort of disappears, and but um, more sort of um, down. Well, the escort, the escort is the only kind of we still two peaks, but both uh, of them mitigated compared to the pre pandemic. Um, so we also look at the mode of transportation used, right? And so we look at and so as uh, the Speakers mentioned that um, telecommuters definitely drive more, can I walk more, a lot less transit, um, uh, biking, other modes are similar. So, and we look at the VMT as well. So, it's very much rice food, and we look at the meat um, instead of the, uh, the, the mean value. And we actually find, I think this is my, I, I mean, I guess one good finding. Is that the telecom seem to travel significantly less distance, and as well as a smaller number of uh, VMT as well. So this is not including the VMT by transit, and we're looking at the VMT by auto. Um, and what about the modes uh, for those non-mandatory trips? And very much similar, right? More driving, more walking. And Less uh, spatial redistribution as well, and we look at you know, with home removed as I mean home as the only anchor point now. Do actually telecommuters try to tend to complete those shopping and meal related trips, for example, closer to home? And the answer is yes. So, <clears throat> um, and this is looking at actually the extent of one's footprint uh, in terms of the extent of their activity space right, for the whole day. And so we are asking, okay, now with work is move that whether the extent of telecommuters footprint is similar or smaller. And yes, they are a little bit similar, but physically they're not, they're not significantly similar. So I think that actually um, coincides with what Tracy was saying, I did not stay at home, still going, and they have to cover a similar um, amount of activities. And so this is a summary. I, um, so uh, summary, yes, fewer number of trips in total, but actually more. Now, um, mandatory trips, more shopping, you know, and personal, and faster in our home, yes. Um, when I was staying, has not really um, less trip training, so they do uh, simple trips and more spread out over the temporal. Um, muted morning peaks, day in peaks out, mode of transportation, and definitely a smaller variety, a deeper variety of or driving, much less. Um, BMT, that's a good point, is that all amount of driving. 
And so my last slide is that uh, this is very much, again, work in progress, and the slides were just given by my students this morning, like 3 o'clock a.m. You know, while I was sleeping, and so those PhD students work very hard. And so hire them. And so um, we want to look at gender households responsibilities, right? Um, has telecommuting reshaped the household responsibilities for females and versus males? And uh, we actually originally, when we started this work, we wanted, I wanted to look at downtown workers. And I think through the conversation with Brian, say, okay, let, let us step back and look at the whole. And then we zoom downtown, so that will be next uh, time, I mean, our next time. And also we want to look at those people who actually do not have access to automobiles and how do they schedule their activity and travel patterns spatially. In, I'm down. <laughs> Great, thank you, Cynthia. I uh, really appreciate uh, your presentation and all of the other panelists. Um, I just wanted to uh, let the audience, particularly those that are online, know that we're aware of some uh, audio issues. Uh, we have people uh, trying to um, pinpoint that, and we'll see if we can kind of get a clear um, sound coming from the live portion. I don't think this is uh, impacting people that are there in person, but I think the, the people that are online uh, have been experiencing this a little bit. Um, and so we'll, we'll try to uh, do our best to kind of carry on the conversation uh, and also improve that. Um, second note is that um, everybody who registered for this event will be getting a follow-up email afterwards. And that follow-up email will have the link to the presentation slides. So there's no need for you to search around. Uh, once they're available, you'll get that in the inbox uh, as part of your kind of debrief from this event. So we had three extremely interesting uh, conversations. Uh, they were all very uh, much grounded in data. And I think that's where I would like to start uh, being uh, part of the PSRC data department as well. Um, both Karen and Tracy's work, uh, yours involved a lot of different cities. Um, Cynthia, your work was uh, specific to the Puget Sound region, which is great, and we can see what's going on here. I'm kind of asking this for people that are not uh, in your shoes. So people that are uh, in city halls, people who are staff, who may or may not be data savvy, who may not have resources and the know-how and the connections to data specifically for their region or their downtowns. What should, um, what, what are your recommendations as far as data to look at? Uh, I, w one of the things I worry about is people kind of running from this uh, panel and wanting to buy cell phone data, whatever they could get their hands on, right? But I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of know-how, there's a lot of kind of investment in time uh, and money to kind of get some data that's not necessarily publicly available. So if you were consulting and kind of working with everyday cities, not just ones that are on your list already, what would you recommend that people look at as far as data is concerned? Um, and if it's something that is not readily available, uh, what can they do to kind of help with this data issue to really know what's going on in their own downtowns, in their own cities? I'll go first quickly. I think this is a huge issue. Um, the issue is that there's a lot of data out there that has big problems and that isn't well vetted. And it's difficult to tell the difference between the stuff that's really well vetted and the stuff that's not. It is, you know, especially for like what you're describing, right? Like uh, a user who's just like, who is responsible for delivering outcomes and results and who doesn't have a ton of time to, or resources to like to, to vet. I think that um, when you're in that situation, you need to have trusted partners who can talk this through with you. That's going to be your MPO in many cases. Most MPOs had, they have, they carry significant modeling responsibilities 
and have to work with data really deeply. So um, you need those relationships so you can pick up the phone. And then, um, you know, I, I personally, I want to believe that like both within academia and in the think tank universe, that there are also trusted sources like that myself and Karen can be a resource to cities. And, um, you know, and I think you see that like in the scholarship that um, that a lot of people are trying to do right now. Um, the challenge is like wading through it all. And um, like, you know, don't start with like, I hey, I just like need more data. Like start with the questions that you really need to answer, <laughs> that you actually really need to answer and that you think you don't have the right data for. Um, because I think the bigger challenge right now is my my concern is that I don't, there are plenty of cities where I don't even hear people asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Like, why does it matter what the office vacancy rate in your downtown is, et cetera. So more time into coming up with the right questions and then the right data to answer those questions will find you. Great, thank you, Tracy. Um, Karen or? Yeah, I love that, yeah, Tracy, that, that's absolutely dead on you. <laughs> we gotta ask the right questions. I think two things that, you know, with the phone data, I just wanna talk about that for a second. You know, people have really um, jumped onto that bandwagon and um, it's actually a moving target. Um, so and so there, there is a lot of testing of cell phone data and we kind of know, it, it, it basically it's fairly representative um so that's sort of the good news um um except you kind of want got to wonder who's in that sample which providers you know is it verizon t-mobile and who's who 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 uses which provider and which is providing the data to the self the cell phone data aggregators and so you, there's still a lot of room for questions um but the the thing about the cell phone data is I, what I've seen over the last two years is that it's going down. The sample's going down over time. And we started with 18 million cell phones in North America. And now we're at 12 or something. And once you start to slice and dice to answer questions about space, about downtown and about neighborhoods, you're starting to get at a point where you don't don't have enough uh, um sample size to to actually answer the question so i i actually don't think people are going to be using phone data a couple of years from now i think it's going to be something different um i don't know what um but it it there will be other data sources that come up um and so we, we you should always question what you see in the cell phone data um but secondly you know it's it's really all in the joining of the data it's it, so telling the story is about figuring out what are the different aspects of recovery say and then and linking different data sources to tell that story and they can individually not be very interesting so you know i i like to link you know transit ridership and sales data and uh office space occupancy you know and that together tells a story that's what brookings that's what tracy does all the time is is that density office space and and um economic sector data you know and that's the magic of it so i you know as a as a professor i always think we we we're not doing a good enough job of teaching our students because they're graduating, they're going to work for PSRC and they, they don't necessarily know, you know, how to do that joining magic and to get to the story uh, that they need to tell. So, um, so in the end, I think that that's, that's going to be the answer is, is, is that kind of magic. Right. Cynthia, I know that cell phone data is in your wheelhouse. Was there anything that you wanted to add? Cynthia. We can't hear Cynthia on the Zoom. Can someone check and make sure her mic is on? Yeah. My mic is on. Oh, there right now. Now we can yeah. hear you. Oh, okay. Maybe I just need to um, target more closer. So, yes. And so cell phone data one is that based, um, um, we have found lots of issues with the cell phone data. And so I guess I disagree just a little bit from Karen's um, 
um, statement that cell phone data is representative, and the one is, I think we look at two dimensions of representatives, and the one is who is in the data, and also uh, the second dimension is given um, who is in the data set, what the data tells us about the activity travel pattern. See both um, has issues. Um, so for example, one of the findings we see is that um, as you have more observations per person, the number of trips um, um, that um, incurred uh, also increases as well, which is um, a red flag for us. Um, but I think the, um, the larger issue is also mobile phone data is that we now use common definition of what is, for, what is a trip and what is a stay. So previously for many decades when we used also travel survey data, what is a trip and what is the stay, what is an activity are clearly defined. Now um, our own work um, find that, you know, how many trips are inferred and how many stays are inferred really depends upon what threshold in terms of space and time that you defined. Um, and those definitions uh, are oftentimes not um, reviewed. And so I think there needs to be a lot of whole community effort involving you know, agencies and academic and really coming back to define what should be the common set of procedures uh, that, that are to be applied to those data sets. And so we have common definitions of what is a trip and what is a stay. Um, so that's one comment. And the other, um, I agree with um, Karen in terms of the need for data fusion and data link. And also um, the need for as academics that we don't do a good job in terms of training our students um, by really viewing transportation as really interdiscipline. And so engineering students may not know uh, data about office occupancy and uh, sales data. And the planning students may not know that, you know, the loop data, the flow data that we engineering students often deal with and to do a, a better job. And um, I think that's it. <laughs> that's my comment. Great. So thank you, everybody, for humoring me uh, going down a wonky road. I'm going to pivot a little bit and uh, focus a little bit on maybe what uh, the audience might be interested in. There's uh, a couple of references. Uh, Markham made a reference to the Doom Loop. Um, Tracy certainly uh, had a bunch of headlines. Um, this question is really about public discourse. Uh, the media, obviously, is a big part of that. Um, I kind of want to know from your perspective, A, um, why does it matter? Why does it matter uh, what the media is saying uh, or not? Uh, and then also from what you are hearing uh, in the public discourse, what are some things that are uh, that people are getting right out there? Uh, we've heard a couple of things that I think myths that we want to debunk, but what are some things that are kind of on the money that you you generally agree with and that you think there should be more of or that we should talk more about? Should I go first again? I'll just jump sure, in. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep, okay. let's keep moving. Okay. It matters what the media says because... Um, both elected officials and the general public are highly responsive to headlines. Um, I think that, you know, there's this sense that like everyone's getting their news from TikTok or whatever now. Um, I think that people are like uh, really grossly underestimating how sensitive elected officials, um, especially older ones in particular are to legacy media headlines. And um, that there is, even if like, you don't see like a primary role for like uh you know what's what's in the paper it still is having like a secondary influence on like what it is that people are talking about on social media or whatever um so i think that it is a big driver of attention and that and and that's why it matters um and so i put a fair amount of my time into trying to inject nuance mm -hmm. and um, encourage uh, productive framing around the issues facing cities. That's This is like a big chunk of like how I spend my day um, because I'm so concerned about that. Um, your second question, 
you had you had kind of two questions together. It was yeah, like, what, what, what's the media getting right? Or I mean, we or what, what's on... one thing they're getting right? Okay, yeah. so I think like we're, one thing we are all starting to understand is um, that the flight to quality is real. That like what's happening isn't that all offices are over forever, but that the way we're using offices is changing so fundamentally and so permanently that old office buildings are going to be continually outcompeted by new product. And that means that the owners of older buildings and also the places where older buildings are concentrated have a problem on their hands. Right. So what the public is getting now um, is the Taylor Swift effect. And I think that, you know, I think that came across really clearly. And that's about um, the economy and about why people want to get together in, in spaces, is, you know, culture, entertainment, arts, um, tourism, all, you know, all these things. And I, you know, I think we're beginning to understand that we're starting to see that after a long time I and mean, we've been I've been saying for years it's the, the economy stupid um you know that people just can't seem to you know get that that again this this urge to kind of just you know put bike lanes and say we're done um there's it you really have to go back to the fundamentals but I do think that whole message that there's a whole lot of other stuff outside of work that's gonna regenerate our cities and I, I think that is coming across. Great. Cynthia, do you want to add something? I don't have anything to add, and I agree with both Tracy and Karen on this. Okay, so we only have a couple minutes left, and given that this is a TOD uh, um, event, I really want to turn back to the T. Um, I think, Tracy, you've made a mention to buses, and you uh, made an emphasis to that. I'm just curious what your general thoughts are in a very short, uh, pithy response in terms of, like, what about transit? What about transit and downtown um, and the directions in which the cities are, are going in? Right, because the doom loop is actually happening for a lot of major U.S. transit systems, and we got to talk about this. Um you know, I think I kind of, I hit the hot points in my talk. I have a new essay with additional data out about this. If people want to read more about what I think about the future of transit. But um, I, I want to be clear, first and foremost, I believe strongly that transit has a future. First off, it must have a future because uh, demand for mobility is not going away. Zoom is not a substitute for being able to go places and do things. So unless we all want to die in traffic and not meet our climate goals, transit has to have a future. So that means TOD is more important than ever, that we need a land use that can support a transit as a mode beyond downtowns as like very dense concentrations of employment, right? The reason why work travel is so overrepresented in transit mode share in big cities is because historically employment is the densest land use and you put a lot of stuff in one place. That is the kind of demand for mobility that is easier for transit to serve. So we need to, it's, this is like what Markham was saying earlier. It's all about proximity density, putting a whole bunch of stuff together. And so if employment is decreasing as a land use that can provide intense, consistent, dense demand, then we need TOD across all uses more than ever to do that so that we can get around without having to drive ourselves and then store cars wherever we go. Great. Tracy, thank you. Karen, I see that you're in transition. Uh, any last words about transit? Yeah, I, you know, I the it's trending in the right direction. So, um, so, and and I think it's particularly, you know, the cities that were seeing increases before the pandemic, Seattle, for instance, and. Uh, you know, I think that's, I think it's, it's going to come back, and we should, uh, we, we need to really. Um, 
keep our transit systems safe and uh, keep investing in them. But because in the long run, um, uh, that that demand will come back, um, especially as we as we as Tracy's saying, put more density around transit stations, uh, which we're all working on in our various cities. Yeah. Great. Cynthia, you always have the hard job. Any last words about transit that you want to provide? <laughs> yes. And so one, yeah, I agree that, yes, we must have transit for urban areas. And the two, um, I think um, the way um, in the future that we run transit service will be different. And so I think fixed route service will continue to um, exist, but we also will be um, on-demand transit as well. And one thing I feel that we should be doing a much better job is prediction of arrival time, especially for the buses. And I think it's pretty pretty unreliable um, in this region and the rest of the country. And I hope what I said does not offend anybody here is that I just came back from China um, one week ago and the ability of their being able to predict a second and a minute you know, for cars and uh, buses and the uh, rail is just awesome. It's like, so impressive. Like, you know, I don't know why we can't do that. Great. So uh, lots to look forward to. Thank you, everybody. Um, Tracy, Karen, uh, Cynthia, uh, we had a wonderful time having you on this panel. Um, Everybody, uh, this is our break time. We're just a couple of minutes over. Uh, I think the second panel is scheduled to go at 1045. So please take a break and we'll resume in about 13 minutes. Thank you. Good morning. It's so good to be here. And I also want to express gratitude to my friends at PSRC. I always enjoy, it's always an honor pleasure to collaborate with you and I'm I'm really happy to be invited here today. Um, I'm just going to kick things off, not by introducing us, but by asking you all to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your role, and then talk a little bit about how you adapted, how you see adapt the pandemic. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm Michelle Allison, general manager of King County Metro, as the largest system here at Ability mobility agency is really important to the conversation we're having today. When the pandemic first hit, I was not I was the deputy general manager, so the role evolved over time. I'm fairly new what I have now. However, uh, one clear thing from my perspective is that managing a pandemic service um, provider like Metro during COVID in some ways uh, was much easier than managing that same system in recovery. In an emergency space that we were in, especially at the height of COVID, it was very clear what your objective was. You had to keep people alive. Your employees and the public had guidance and baseline directions, public health, CDC, all those things. So you just did it. You executed, you did it because you knew what that objective was. As we're now in the very real recovery phase still for public transit, it is much harder because you're holding so many more objectives, you're holding so many expectations and requests of your system. You need to have full service. You need to have a supply chain that doesn't have any bumps in the road. You need to pretend that 30% of your workforce that vanished can vanish and bring folks in quickly and encourage all of those folks who now have different travel patterns to come back and use your system, so your system is designed for those just a travel patterns. So that, that tension in our organization to even out and smooth out each one of those areas that are very real and cause blips to the service and needs that are customers. And so we're in this process of what I call very stabilizing our system. Because each one of those elements that got wildly adjusted needs to have that attention to what it looks like now. And it'll change again. But to meet that moment of where we are, both from an employee and a customer, is where we are. And one of the big aha moments for me in that exercise was the value of public transportation for the customer and the employee needed to be better defined for COVID. We use data and metrics to claim our success in transit. That is what we do. How many people here do you use? How many service hours do you 
have, how on top are you? Those numbers are high, far sooner. COVID said the very thing that you want to do, which is pack a bunch of people in a tiny space, is the one thing you can't do. So don't use that metric for success because everyone inside the organization feel like they're failing. And you're actually, the success is the value that you're creating for those people who need to use your system regardless of pandemic. So we had to re-identify what it meant to be a public transit system during COVID. And I think that redefinition, expanded definition, holds true today because it's the value of that trip. The people who use it because they have to, their transit transit, the people who use it because they are also essential workers and are providing supports to healthcare systems or grocery stores or the port or any of those other fundamental foundations of our system, we provide that value. We keep that mobility option regardless. And that has equal weight as the number of people on a coach. And I feel that that needs to be part of our message and live on in transit as we continue to evolve to meet the new problem. What I was so excited about in that, and really nerded out on the data just here too. And so we were really having a great time processing that first panel. Because the, what we're seeing as an agency as we're moving through to a more safe space is exactly what was being discussed. That folks aren't not, they're not wanting to live in their houses or in caves and not see anybody. They want to have their trips differently. And transit needs to then readjust so that we can meet that moment. And we knew we were headed there. Our launch plan in Metro X sort of foresees that as being a pattern. And now we just need to move faster. Because that all day, reliable, safe network, that core, that tenant of transit is even more important now so that we can provide that neighborhood to neighborhood trip, that coffee shop to grocery store to kids school trip. That is the profile of our service that we're going to provide. And that, again, is the mobility part of us. Our fixed route system meets our on-demand flex, meets our smaller, uh, whatever those other things are that we're going to from a mobility perspective. All of those together will make the future of the transit trip. And we're we're seeing that very deep, both in the discussion today and in our own organization. So at least we feel validated very much by the discussion today and know we need to do that a little faster. Um, but the key thing for our organization from that then is change. Every one of these elements comes with change. And for an organization, a public organization, a bureaucratic organization, it's been around for 50 plus years, change can be really settling and really and so we have to continue to provide that vision and that why and that value, both for the customers and the people that are delivering it. So we don't totally make that change experience feel really hard and continue with progress. So that's that's a little bit of what's in our conversation. In the conversation this Andrew, before you, you go on, I just want to acknowledge that um, online, that there are some challenges to the audience. It's going to be a little bit unnatural. But you guys want to turn and talk to each other, but we're going to ask that you, you know, talk directly at the mic. Mitchell, you were doing great, Mitchell. Um, but uh, just going to give you a reminder of like talk to the microphone rather than looking at each other. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? And good morning. I'm Lyle. Now, the principal urban designer um, at the city of Seattle's office of planning and community development, where my mission is to promote urban design excellence throughout the city of Seattle. I think it's no secret that the pandemic and the current employment arrangements that are post-pandemic have been hard for the city. Um, coming back, but it's been it has been challenging. Uh, the mayor now is really focused on activation. And I should say, we have some really significant public health, public safety issues that we must address. I would say those are um, necessary, but not sufficient. And the sufficient extra is a really attractive interest title downtown, because more than ever, downtown needs to be a place that people want to be rather than just have to be. Um, the idea of living downtown close to work is maybe not as important or the draw that it was in the past. Uh, urban designers tend to have kind of the, the longer view on things. And it's important to remember that predicting the future is a bit of a fool's errand. 
Um, for those of you who remember 9-11, it's aftermath. There were really some serious predictions that New York would never ever recover. Um, no buildings taller than five stories, and um, no one would live there. It's falling stock. It, those were serious predictions, and they were in New York is great. We've got more air today than before. So I think we need to remember that yes, um, we need to adapt to change, but we're not certain how things work. And in many respects, perhaps extra um, vacancy is a good thing. It may allow architects, artists, folks who've been priced out of the office um, in our central cities to come back. Um, so again, it's it's hard to predict the future, but we definitely that the solution I think to all of our communities is to make sure that this is people want to be um, and not have to be. I think one of the real revelations for me was the importance of sports and the importance of visitors. I'd always thought those were kind of the icing on the cake, but they were critical and they really need to help Seattle now. Um, people are coming down for events, people are coming down or visiting the city. Our hotel rate, our occupancy rates, are some of the highest country. That, again, nobody comes into your city unless you've got things to offer, and we've got some great things to offer. My place market really saw us through the pandemic. Places that have actually been hurting the most. Our CBD, for example, are the places with the least variety and arguably the least uh, reason to be, uh, a certain reason to visit. So putting an emphasis, um, and that's certainly consistent with the mayor's activation plan. The excitement of opening up our waterfront park is palpable, and that is a great addition to the city, a great reason to be here. And we're doing other stuff. King County is looking at a massive rethink of its whole, whole campus. The city's obviously involved with that, which is and then personally, I'm looking at how we can live more of I-5, um, restitching our communities together, uh, reducing kind of the noxious uh, effects of the open open sewer that is Interstate 5, um, and reconnecting and reconnecting um, neighborhoods, um, adding vitality, livability, park space, and, and importantly, um, uh, housing for our workforce. So uh, that's... You know, that's what we can see now. I think it's going to be diversity. It's going to be um, livability. Those are going to be touchstones um, as we move forward um, in the next decade. Thank you, Lyle Mason. I can see what kind of panel it's going to be by how you described I-5. I mean, uh, <laughs> and I really appreciate Michelle bringing up change as a topic. I feel like this is like a challenge to deal with in government because we all have things that we don't like about the way things are but nobody wants to change the things that cause them we like those things they're comfortable because they're the way things are right now but everything we don't like about the way things are has been caused by the way things are um uh, my name is mayor Bothell. um when the pandemic hit we were a lot like most agencies we had no idea like and i think that's okay to it because the future is inherently unknowable. Like you just can't know. Um, but what became really apparent during that time is that the city has an absolute ton of public space. And most of it is very useful for people because we've paved it to drive on. And in Bothell, we have about 1,600 acres of pavement we've paved to drive on in the city. Um, it's about 20, almost 20% of the entire city we have enough just city-owned roads to stretch to Spokane. So we're facing this moment where nobody goes anywhere and we're all staying home in our stretchy pants. And um, we're all going a little bit crazy inside, especially if you're an extrovert. And um, we needed to get people outside in public space. Um, so we pedestrianized one block of our city um, because we had a few businesses there that needed people in order to squat. Um, and that one block, it was less than I wanted to accomplish at the time, but it was what we had the will to accomplish on council there. Um, and the businesses that did have outdoor areas, um, we didn't let them use the business. We required them to put cars there. So we had a couple levers we could pull to kind of help, help our business and also just help our residents get outside, meet their friends, not worry that they're going to keep grandma when they do so. 
Um, so we, uh, pedestrianized the block of Main Street, we also allowed businesses to use their parking lots to serve customers. Um, and we've got, I mean, one of the things I think of right now, um, in the space that they used to store cars, they can have about 25 people sit and eat. And to me, that's a pretty big win. Um, and the best thing about that was, aside from the economic development piece and the um, something for our residents, our neighbors to do, we didn't have very much. All we had to do was let people use it um, and eliminate the, in my opinion, pretty silly rules that require them to do something that doesn't bring in vibrance, it doesn't really serve our residents, it just really honestly brings more of other people's cars in and we all have in common is that nobody likes other people's cars. Um, it's true, right? Super bad news. My car is the only righteous car. The rest of y'all are traffic. <laughs> um, turns out the vast majority of our residents really like the change. You know, there were informal polls in some different Facebook groups, and they were all like 90% plus. Let's keep it this way. And and that tracks, right? Because we've got enough city roads involved with a stretch to still can. Taking one block and pedestrianizing it, like, it's not a I think we got way too much attention for it, to be honest. Like, this isn't a big thing. This is a tiny little thing. But in that one block, we had restaurants in the street. We had a gym in the street. We've had cultural events that have been run by the community there. We've had our jazz band play concerts there. We've done an event series in Bottle that we, um, we're hosting a bunch of events. And there's just a ton of ways that our community can come together using this space. Um, you know, we had folks in the city who didn't want to do this. And what does everybody predict when you want to do traffic so bad? If there's one thing I am confident of, 20 years traffic is going to be Regardless of the pedestrian as mainstream traffic sucks, nobody likes it. Um, you know, we had a few construction projects going on downtown that were kind of cited as reasons we shouldn't do this. You know, those construction projects are done. And as it turns out, traffic Armageddon. It was fine. People figured out a different way to get around. Um, ultimately, I think the big task that cities have when it comes to downtown is creating a place people want to arrive at. Because if you can create a place where people can meet their friends, and create memories, and feel joy, they're going to go there. You create a place that people drive through, people are going to drive through it to get to somewhere else where they can experience joy, experience community, where they can make memories and really make a place feel like home. Um, I want awful to be that place. I don't want to be the place somebody drives through to enjoy their life. Like, I want to be the place people arrive at to make memories, to make community, all of the things that make living in a special. So, I got. Thank you, Brendan. I feel like uh, we've already been, been said. Yeah. Why share? Um, well, my name is Brendan Nelson. I uh, see a small nonprofit called Empty, and formerly served as president of a action commission. Um, during the pandemic, um, our coalition was heavily responsible for a lot of what was in uh, our neighborhood. So the Hilltop neighborhood is just the hill from Dallas, um, up to Tacoma. Uh, it is a neighborhood that's rapidly changing. Um, if you've been through the neighborhood, I've heard the history. You understand what I mean by that. Um, and so when, when the pandemic hit, just like everyone else, we were totally thrown off. We're, Shocked and sad by shutting down. And the bread and butter of the Hilltop neighborhood um, are, your, are your local mom and pop shops, your small business owners. And so um, when the, the pandemic hit, these, are, you know, these businesses um, hadn't been on, it hadn't uh, had an online presence with being able to purchase items. Um, we were also in the middle of of, of this light road right through the main um, of, of our neighborhood. So here we are in the pandemic. We are in a major, uh, in a major 
construction, as far as uh, transportation. And then there are also four housing units set to be built. So we're in the midst of all of it. Um, and what we were hearing from businesses um, in particular was the folks are not coming because of traffic or uh, uh, construction. So the sidewalks were blocked and um, the streets to get into the main neighborhood were blocked off. And so and what people did was just stayed home. Um, and so the businesses um, suffered. Um, and so as we sat down with um, some of the small business owners, we asked what to do to support you. And they said, we just need to get people moving again, get the, get the good traffic. We can get people here. We'll get them back engaged and um, excited. So, you know, I one we're like, yeah, we're coming through COVID and, and poof, there was another wave and, and you know, a, another. So um, what we created, um, a friend of mine and I were sitting and trying to figure out what can we do as, a, as an organization. And I saw a guy just down the street with a beer. He was walking from, uh, so not that he was with a beer, but he was coming out of the restaurant and hanging out on the front, front, front side. And, um, you know, you've heard of a park call. You want to do a business call. And in that, well, we can figure out a way to make uh, businesses get more support. And so we reached out to downtown on the go. Uh, sound Transit, a local organization in the community that were geared around transportation. So we created this um, business and a map. Everything was walking. Um, and we did it, and did it in a way that was family friendly. Um, we worked with, with the city of Oklahoma around um, helping these businesses get access to some small portions of money to where they can now go and create a, a page where you can buy their products. Um, they were able to uh, give us something to hire photographers to go and take really high quality photos so folks can now um, put these things on, on, on social media and so forth. And we did that um, in August of um, 2020, and it was so successful. We again in December um, for the holidays and again in the spring. So that that business call generated a lot of activity, and as we were able to have a conversation about what is transit for us now in the community, people who are not interested in walking at all definitely got so excited about being able to walk and knowing that they they were supporting small businesses. We had raffles and all these types of things, and it was just great to see. And um, I was just really proud to hear that not one business in the Hilltop uh, neighborhood closed during the pandemic. Uh, in fact, sales increased, um, engagement increased. Um, again, people who weren't active walking were walking more. People were biking more. Uh, had a we have a small area that is called um, Second Cycle. So you can instead of throwing away your bike, take them your bike. They will refurbish and take parts out and create new bikes. Those bikes were going out like crazy, um, and so it was really interesting. And so, in that challenge, what it what it did for us was how do we get how do we reimagine what this could to look like? So, so Brendan, um, the light rail station. Been, am I right? Yes. Okay. Well, I have a question, and let's start with you. Um, mix it up a little bit, but. What and, and you've all talked about this a little bit, but what you learned from the pandemic is kind of affecting what you're doing today. What were the aha moments that you said, "Oh, let's let's take this in forward on the pandemic"? Um, some of the aha were um, don't take no for an There's always a way to get to a yes. That's what we were finding out is, um, and that creativity. 
was just flowing and, and um, coming out. And then that what we realized was that let's not wait for uh, something tragic to happen together. How do we remain with each other during the ups and the downs? Um, and, uh, and being quite honest, the, the light room wasn't something that everybody was excited about. And a lot of folks still aren't excited about that because that also means that um, folks of color are long time um, residents of the neighborhood have been pushed out because housing is up. Um, it's it's those uh, there was a term, uh, you know, when transit comes, it, it it brings consequences that we don't really expect. It's good and it's like, oh, what's going to happen? And so getting people to meet more into community um, and get organization to really round around um, what transit can look like because it was coming and it's here. So how do we navigate with this? So a place to get families involved. So scavenger huts on the, the light rail, all those types of things. Um, so, so the pandemic allowed us like, let's not take the, the no for the answer, um, but think of how we get to a yes or a where we can agree. Also, our voices need to be uh, heard at the table as well. So that was that was big for us, and you know, I was part of a uh, light rail. It's inception of fifteen. It's opening, and I, from the beginning, and in twenty fifteen, when we talked about the light rail, people who were just so upset about it, frustrating, it, or then celebrating because of what it what it brought to the community and what that meant. So there's still a lot around that. People look at me with fear, and I say it's a blessing in COVID um, because it caused a pause and to think um, how we were doing this and how we were engaging and how we um, were just in um, with each other. That's a really segue. Curious um, about the city perspective. Um, Maya, what, what do you, what, what did COVID impact? What was the impact of what you're doing today? Well, it certainly was a reminder that housing is just critically important um, to success, um, success of the city. Worth recalling that uh, 1970s, early 80s, housing use prohibited or prohibited in our downtown. Um, and so it's become an incredibly limited bank. Uh, we know thousands of residential units are downtown. But if we're going to use housing as a stabilizer, again, there has to be rich amenity, there has to be space, there has to be things that make downtown. So in terms of the perspective, we're looking at both promotion of amenity, but also looking at ways, for example, of converting um, existing office commercial space uh, to residential homes. Uh, it's a thorny issue. Probably have seen a lot of discussion um, in the press, but we think it's a lot of uh, silver bullet, but it's part of the silver buckshot. Well, that we need um, one of the solutions to downtown. It's lively, um, but also, um, plus, it's worth pointing out, we have such a transit rich environment. It's only getting um, that is a regional source, um, regional connectivity. We can't swap that. So, from a TOD perspective, housing also makes a ton of sense. Thanks, Lyle. How about you, Jason? You know, in the pandemic, we did a lot of things differently because our context changed immediately. We had to. But we don't need the pandemic change things. We can just do different things if we want to get different results. And there's this idea that if we change things, that we have to do everything that's going to happen. We have to be able to predict all of the implications of the change down the road. And we'll never know that because it's the future. The other thing
do so. And that's really the biggest. Michelle, I know from our past discussions, there was such a dramatic shift in how you had to think from a transit standpoint. And it's more about the single user or the essential user and not the crowd people. And now I'm super curious because we have to go back to a different way of, about transit. But what are you looking forward to those interesting shifts and learnings? I think from a safety service side, the uh, all day networks, what became really important, as I mentioned earlier, and just the back to the basics of frequency, reliability, and safety for a system that was having challenges with all three of those, it was a clear focus. If we wanted to keep people on our system, bring people back on our system, we need to take action to really address this. Because what the public is wanting is more service, but they're not going to get more service don't have more right to the system, right? It's this like cycle that makes itself. So we needed to first not just expand a bunch of stores, but actually make sure the service that was out on the street was actually reliable, frequent as we could, and safe. That is the tenant and it has always been of transit. So it wasn't necessarily a new revelation from that standpoint. And that's the work. We have done a lot of things to stabilize and to continue to address safety both real and and to then work on reinvesting service hours to get two more things. The other big learning I have still is being really realized organization is inside. Public sector work, we don't talk enough about the people who are doing it. Metro has long been a planning organization that focuses on where we want to be from an investment perspective and what uh, and look ahead, build and do vision. What COVID did is say, yeah, you're not going to know any of that, but what you do know is that you have a majority workforce that could walk out the door any time because of retirement out. That you as a agency with all of your trades have underinvested in getting a new generation of workforce to be your vehicle maintenance workers, to be your facilities workers, your operators. You've undervalued those really good jobs and you're in a market where you have a lot of competition with high tech and other things that we're seeing play out in the day earlier. So what you need, Metro, it's great that you're a planning organization and you know how to do that. We now need to be an employer of choice. So what does it look like to focus back inside the agency and actually go invite people to join you, reinvent the ways that you do business, work with your labor partners to come up with an attractive economic proposal to get people to choose you instead of Amazon, right? This is the world we work in. And we, for a long time, sort of said, operate, right? you do, you have full out to in time, do the thing, but we're going to go dream. And COVID said, that's not what you need. You need to now look at people who are delivering that service, make sure they have what they need so they're going to keep showing up and then go welcome them. And we're still very much in that process. And that I'm grateful for because every single person who's at Metro is making a choice to spend their day with us. And we want to honor that so that they can go back out into the community that they spend. It's the same one we spend and say they're a great employer, they do good work. You should join them both as a transit agency and as a Thank you. I think that's probably a theme for all of us. We need to focus on different kinds of workers because our system breaks down if we don't have, if we don't have all workers. Um, so Lyle, Lyle's mantra is planning for the future is, is a fool's errand. Or, or make, but, but we have to make assumptions, right? We have to make assumptions about um, the future so that can lay the groundwork for the next step. So I'm very curious to hear from all of you. While I want to know what you're thinking. Well, I work in the planning business, which is, of course, all of the future. But it's just a reminder that plans, make plans, oftentimes realized or they're not realized in the way that you think, which is why resilience, why the ability to accommodate uh, in terms of land use, we've become a much more flexible city. Um, I would love personally the whole concept of CBD, um, which you have a high concentration of office. Um, you know, is what's the future? I don't know. But maybe by eliminating these things that clearly help, we allow the future in a better, better way. 
Michelle, I'm curious what you have to say. Uh, I think uh, Metro has a very strong vision for where we want to be, fast, frequent, reliable. We know that the modes of investment in every neighborhood that people are making, Buffalo is a great example. How can we partner with those individual cities throughout the county and really understand what this looks like for them from a mobility perspective to get that frequency so that it's really easy choice. We also are working to make uh, it just a really good user experience where you can show up. There's just that ability. You don't that's time schedule because it's going to come very regular. You can just have a lot of confidence in your city. That, that is a vision that we really want to carry forward. And we want to do it as a community. The best part of planning is it gives you an opportunity to go invite people who can you serve to say, what do you want? Is this right? And it's cities, and it's individual users, it's community based organizations, much like we heard of today, the power in community. So that when things do shift, you have that relationship. And you said we're making this assumption we can still hold. And that I think is the, the power of where we are right now is going to back out to the community, to our jurisdictional partners, to our major uh, groups like UW and others to say we have this really great vision for this fast movement network that has a bunch of service in it. Is does it still does it still match what we're seeing as the trends for the people you're serving? And I think really finding this moment to validate what we assume to be the right thing is the power so that creates a lot more momentum. Yeah, I do want that. That is the 10 minute, 7 minute service that I want in my neighborhood. Maybe put it on this block because we've pedestrianized, right? Like those things have changed in the past couple of years. And I think that's the power of it, is that you're doing it collectively and not just together with your own Brendan, you're in the middle of shift, so it'll be interesting to think about that. Yeah. Um, so, Michelle, you hit it right on the um, and file it as well. So interesting, he was, Rachel and I were a brief conversation before we started here. She mentioned a sub area of, of, at the Hilltop Pass and some initial work that, and I shared that in my second Bible. I read it back and, and it was so, um, so rich, but I realized um, in that so many things in there had to shift um, as, as our neighbors. So include the link light rail look like. And just to give you an example of um, what I mean by this. So there was this whole plan about the light rail and what happened what it was going to look like and all these things. And then people in the community started to question like, well, who was talking to you about this? And what does that mean? So questions were to arise and the city said, well, we need to pause and actually engage um, our community. So the, so the city council there appointed this task force. Um, we were brought on for 18 months to, to help me work around the light realm that was engaging the community. I mean, um, the artwork to uh, the installation that we put in and all those things forward. Um, and so those problems have shift and change. And what we're seeing now is, you know, there could be a plan, but not engaging the community. You don't have to go back and reassess. That's an exception. So I think that's been the, the beauty um, in um, Tacoma is that we have elected officials who aren't afraid to think outside the box. We have folks who are working in the city that are, that are kind of pushing that to kind of let's, let's recreate this, this narrative. Um, you know, transit can be exciting. It can be different. It can be engaging. And so we've taken um, advantage of so many opportunities that I've heard today around, um, you know, open space. So there's a lot of vacant spaces that have been in our neighborhood. And we're saying we have businesses, people who are um, pop up markets. Let's take this big building and make it a or pop-up market for um, small business owners. I don't think we've been there um, have, have the pause, you know? And so now there's, now there's conversations around, well, we were just with that building. Maybe we should move into doing this that's going to give back um, to the community. And so I just love this, this piece of um, things don't always work like we plan them. And what I've learned is that our community has really been in so much um, to 
what is going on. My parents weren't really involved in any community things now or going to city council and asking a really important question because they felt invested. Questions were asked, but what do you want to see? Like, oh, well, you got to hear my, my thoughts and opinions and not just check a box. Um, but actually, journey with them. And so, um, we're right in the, in the thick of things. A lot of we have um, two housing developments that have opened right on the, on the border, on the uh, transit line. There's intentionality around what that was going to be. So, folks who are transitioning from homelessness, uh, folks who are transitioning from the prison system, which we know is very difficult to get driver's license to you know, get access to, to be right on. Um, okay, um, uh, makes it so much easier to get to work, uh, get your kids to school, things like that. And so, these conversations in the city and uh, a developer in the community is, have, has brought out so much more. Um, community instead of saying, stop that over there and take it or leave it, but it's been this whole engagement um, process. And what the city has, has done after this community is saying. Before we move forward, uh, developers come in. We want you to go and talk to the, sit down and to what I call the Mr. Johnson, the folks who've been there for 40, 50 years, hear their stories, and that does, that impacts how you move. That impacts how how you work. And so I think that's been a great shift for for the city and for um, our neighborhood folks up. Thank you. How about you, Mason? I don't even know what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> we were, what were we talking about? I got, <laughs> oh, yeah. I got what lost are, the thing. What are your, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, for the future, right? Like, we, we know it's hard to plan for the future, but you have to make some assumptions. Totally. Uh, you, you have to plan for the future. I mean, that's our job. I mean, as policymakers, we make decisions. These decisions take an awful long time to actually bear. Like when we rezone an area, nothing happens. Like we have to wait for that development to actually happen. So we have to have an eye on the future. And we need to care about the future more than we care about the now or the past because the future is the only thing we can control. I cannot control, I cannot do anything about the way things are right now. But I can do something about the way things might be tomorrow or a year down, 10 years down. What we can is we can't let the unknown about the future keep us from being the kind of people we want to be to make a difference for the future. And, you know, I, I think a lot about kids. You know, the median family home in Boston are around a million dollars right now. Um, my kids are six. And when in 20 years, when their family are looking to our roots, how on earth are they going to be able to? Nobody has the answer to that question because there's not an answer to that question. And our kids get to choose the context that they in the world in. We choose that for them. And we're making choices right now that will determine the context of our kids and where they get to live. I mean, are we going to allow our children to live in the communities that raised them? Or are we going to say that no, if you lived here when you grew up, it would ruin the character of the neighborhood? I think my kids are pretty good kids most of the time, yeah. <laughs> with with some notable exceptions. <laughs> but um, I don't think they're going to ruin the character of any. And I think our answer to the question of our kids saying, "Can I live in the community that I've grown up in?" should be affirmatively, positively yes. We want you to be able to stay in this community that raised you with your family, friends, your support network, and. If we don't change the way we do things, we are telling them. And that does not match our true values. And that is not the kind of people that I know we want to be. We just can't let the things we don't know about the future scare us away from being the kind of people that we can be proud of. Because our kids, the same people that we're deciding right now, we don't want you to live here, they're going to write the books about us. They're going to remember we did this. They're going to live it. And they're going to be the ones telling stories to their kids about what we do. And that's a pretty big deal. So, so I, I often think about the future just in terms of what is it going to be like for my kids 
to live when they grow up and all of their friends and all of our parents because we've all kids or grandkids. We all care. So we should make policy decisions that are in line with that. That's not at all. What I just went with it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really agree with you, Lyle, that a central business district, it's built to fail, really. It's just a single purpose. Come downtown, go to work, come home. You don't want to hang downtown, right? We talked a little bit this morning about Europe and how it's different there. It's where you hang out. And now they have their recoveries way better than ours. People, they want to go downtown. Their life was disrupted by having to stay home and there are things for them to do downtown. Um, and another kind of a epiphany or, or moment from the previous presentations this morning that I thought was interesting was the, was the high percentage of casual trips downtown, right? People that just, I guess I'm still trying to understand exactly what that is. Maybe somebody that comes down to go to the dentist, maybe they have lunch, they do some shopping. Um, if that's the highest percentage of people that are visiting downtown in, in the tourists, then I, you know, one of the things that we need to consider is how do we make down attractive for all groups of people, office workers, residents, and visitors. So uh, I guess I'll start with Lyle. That's a simple question. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, that's a super complicated question. I want to understand part of it, which is um, we do have a Seattle, both broadly as a city and downtown as a specific place. It's become so that you're getting very select who can want to come downtown. And likewise with downtown. Uh, you know, it's a really complicated puzzle, but I think it's something we do need to address because you want that diversity. You want downtown, you want your um, or to be to the entire region, attractive, entire city, um, the health, health of the city um, really does for the whole, whole region. And you want that, again, to be um, a really a dazzling place for people. Come as tourists, but more important, I think, actually, I, as an urban designer, believe that you design your city for the people live in your city. You do that well, tourist. Um, and I think it's a great way to think about how to sure that it's attractive to everyone, not just a certain segment, and people who are sitting. Thank you. Brandon, do you have thoughts about this? Um, I love that question. Um, Again, a lot of my work is up from the downtown area, but um, I, I've worked a lot in the downtown area. What we're seeing is the um, University of Washington, pretty much the, the biggest uh, uh, landowner in that area. Um, what I'm loving what they're doing is the Chancellor, saying, I'm putting together task for or disadvice from the community. They're going to continue to develop and purchase property and so forth. But wanting to, uh, again, back to the um, So our downtown is the difference from just right up the hill. Um, so what some of the conversations are around, how do we kind of this connection of downtown to hill that it's all kind of makes sense. In a, in a way, um, because the Hilltop is a black neighborhood, very uh, culturally centered around arts and things like that. How do we make this connection? And so there are um, a lot of conversations happening. But, um, it's so interesting because there's so many folks who are wanting business districts to be hired in our community. And um, that's been an interesting conversation. What I'm learning is that there's Collaboration, and that always hasn't been the case. Um, so these uh, uh, large landowners, the university, and they're all having conversations around what can this look like. 
I'm excited um, what comes of it. Our, our downtown area has struggled uh, for the years. The pandemic definitely took us out. Uh, our downtown uh, was just taken out. Um, and so imagine what that looks like. Um, it's going to be amazing. Again, loving the conversations that we had, and not just, yeah, we want this. Uh, we want a whole room five star restaurants, and then nobody can go for it. We need to go and uh, enjoy this restaurant. But we need a mix of, of things. And so, um, I look forward to what is out of that. And um, again, people from their voice. The other folks that like to build it for folks who are, who are living there. The challenge is, in particular, where I'll speak for the Hilltop, is that the folks who were there were pushed out. Now it looks very different. You know, so we're asking when, and wanting for color to be homeowners to come back to the They're coming back to that looks very different from what they what they know. It's, it, it, it definitely takes um, conversation, collaboration happen. Um, and so I so I really end this work to lean into your community. Um, these graphic organizations like the one that I'm part of, they're, those ears are to the ground and you can hear and know what uh, people would love to see. Um, our tanker, um, the, they are definitely in tune with the and business owners, what that goal is like and how it shaped. And so I'm, I'm encouraged. By that. Mason, you've already touched on this quite a bit, but I'm really curious. You know, what do you think is key in downtowns for everyone? People. Like people. Most of our problems, people showing up is how you vitalize the area. It makes me laugh a little bit that we're like, how do we attract people downtown? And also, how do we solve a housing crisis? This is an unsolvable problem. <laughs> and a mystery to me. Can anybody help me? I think we have planners. Um, like, I, I love Kansas for a lot of our big problems because. They're all connected and um, housing close to other housing services can bring vibrancy without bringing people's cars. Other people's cars really like the defining ethic behind how we run our cities right now because nobody likes them. Like, and that includes all of us. Like, we're like, y'all are traveling, cars right. And um, I had another one. What was it? Oh, and when we push people away, Mostly because either we think they're going to drive cars or they're the wrong kind of people. Both of those are really, really bad reasons to push people away and keep making all of the problems worse. Um, we um, we push neighbors and and really future residents. That's our kids. And when people come to my housing, like housing, I'm going to just stop this and start over. Again. People come into my council chambers and say, "No, this building you've seen too much already." Nobody ever said the reason I can go off is run too fast because when I go for a walk at night, I see people. I don't want it. like people like other people. The problem is when you push people away, they still need to be where they go. And so now about 10,000 people a day drive awful to work. And a lot of those are frontline workers who simply can't afford to live in our community. And, um, do that as a cash opportunity because we've already got the problems. We already need awful. Like we already have things we don't like. But if we build housing closer to services and all the other, houses, we can revitalize our services. We can bring more. We can have more neighbors we see for a walk. Um, we can realize some tax revenue, which lowers the upward tax pressure on everybody else. Which most of my community is a big fan of in general. Um, and we have to get over this idea that bringing people in what's causing our problems. What's causing all of the problems is the way that we 
allow people to be brought in right now. And that's what we need to change, not do people. Like, I, I don't see population control is a morally acceptable solution to just about any problem. So if we aren't going to do that, we have to find a better way to do this. And, and more housing in closer proximity to all of the other housing and all of the services that people need in their daily life and close to transit is just how we fix housing. It's not just how we fix downtown revitalization. It's how we fix climate. It's how we help fight historic wrongs around racial injustice. Because aside from as far as racism, is the other thing that's driven what our built environment looks like. So when we build more housing between all of the other housing, we ignore all of the reasons people tell us that we can't do that. We make all of our problems better, not worse. And that's my job. I'm going to jump off track a little bit. Um, because I'm really... And I'm going to apologize to you, Lyle, for asking this question. <laughs> but I really, I really agree with what Mason said about housing people. And, I, and you brought up housing as well, and Terezi Converse, which we, we all know is a really thorny issue, especially because our central business system here is all these high rise things that were really, they are really only good office, right? So, so, from an urban planning standpoint, how do, solve that kind of intractable problem in downtown specifically. First of all, I want to set the record straight. I like our CBD. I want to kill the concept <laughs> of CBD. <laughs> um, um, and the, the truth is, um, I, I, much of the surprise to me, um, I was thinking that office conversion could only happen in those pre-war buildings, those buildings that have a small floor plate, windows that open, that kind of thing. But around the country, I was just in New York uh, last month in the financial district, and they're converting 1970s era um, buildings um, successfully. And they're expensive, but by New York standards, not <laughs> especially expensive. So I think that actually is a real opportunity. Now, we've talked about the challenges. Uh, one of the big challenges, of course, is that building owners, office owners, that's their business, that's what they know, and they're really reluctant um, to, to shift in terms of their whole business model. But I think if we can get a few examples, and that's what we're doing in my office right now, working with folks who have proposals um, to figure out how we can adjust and be flexible with the building code. Most of our land use codes allow that kind of conversion and flexibility, but it's the building code that's especially challenging, uh, and we're very loath to uh, eliminate any life safety requirements, as you can imagine. But to the degree that we can provide flexibility to help those offices or some of those offices um, change into residential, it's a just it's a win win. Um, and as hard as it is from a city perspective, it's something we definitely want to pursue. Thank you, um, Michelle. I'm curious about what you think. I mean, you're in the currency of getting people to the downtown, but what, what do you think um, we need to do to build downtowns for all people? A uh, great question. And of course, Metro plays uh, a partnership role in answering that. We have a very clear way that we can contribute uh, in to, to support all of the other good comments that have been made today. And what Metro has learned over the many, many years of being in business is that in this area in particular, we have a lot of choice writers people who could use their car, but for one reason or another, they choose transit. And so we need to always continue to ask them and ourselves, why are they choosing transit? And what would make more people continue to use transit instead of their car? Oh, and of course, to ensure that those transit dependent riders have the system that works for them. But really that growth is in those uh, choice riders. And we know that we are an interesting region with I-5 and Puget Sound. And so traffic is a mess. And so oftentimes that's one reason for the choice. But when you talk about bringing people to downtown and the experience and why transit could be a really important partner in that is not just the transit trip itself. It's what gets you to the transit trip and it will get, it's what gets you to your final destination. That is also really important for us to be considering. And Metro can certainly play a key role in that. What is the walkability like? What are, what are the environmental conditions? What's the lighting? 
what is the what are the amenities there? What's the technology that's available to you? Is it easy to use? Is it easy to understand? Does it sort of facilitate your whole experience in a way that you don't have to think about it? You don't have to have this five-step plan about how you're going to get your bus trip home, right? It's just this, it's this really unconscious way where people say, hey, why do you use transit? And you say, ah, it's just easy. Not, oh, because the 36 is the most frequent than it did. Like, it's just, we're going to do things in our self-interest. It's just what people do. And if you're making your choice to get out of your car, your self-interest is because it's easier, it's cheaper, it's faster, and it's a good experience. And we have uh, a responsibility with and ability with our partner agencies at the city and other organizations to really help with that, with the built environment from the capital, with the technology, as well as service. So it's really that whole user experience that I think we need to be conscious of as we have this really good opportunity. If we're going to go invest into downtown, let's think about what it looks like to be a pedestrian because pedestrians get on buses too, right? Let's think about what it looks like to ride your bike. Bike riders get on buses too. So there's a lot of mutual um, sort of way to look at this with a lot of different constituencies that include transit, but also much more expanded from it. Too. Well, I knew this was going to happen. I still have a lot of, a lot more questions for y'all, but we're out of time, right? <laughs> we're out of time. Okay. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and being here and having us all. I really enjoy talking with you all at the Urban Land Institute. I'm fully consumed with transit-oriented development and urban revitalization. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea, for a wonderful job uh, moderating this panel. Thank you, uh, Brendan, Lyle, Mayor Thompson, Michelle. Uh, wonderful to, to hear all of the comments. Um, just a, a few words about closing and a, a few words about um, kind of next steps for those that, that are staying here. One, I I heard it's about people. Um, I think was the thing that, that each of you kept repeating, whether that's uh, people being downtown, how to, how, how to have our neighborhoods, our smaller downtowns to be attractive places for people. But also, Michelle, I really like how you talked about um, also your workers that it, it's, you know, who people who choose to show up at work, who continue to work, who want to come and be your future employers, really just focusing on people that um, we have to move out of that mindset or perhaps COVID helped us move out of the mindset of that people will just do things because they have to, that it created a lot of choice for people, for some people anyways, and that we need to be responsive to. You know, why do people want to do it? Why do people will go where they want to go? They'll, they'll, they'll go to where the, the Taylor Swift concert is, as we heard. Um, they'll spend money. They'll go to restaurants. They'll do things if we create that opportunity, if we create the traction, if we create the transit, transportation choices, and so on. Um, in, in some ways, it harkened back to you know, how American cities may, may be used to have been, where our downtowns and our our downtowns had more people in them and our neighborhoods had more services in them. Now, over 50 or so years, we kind of separated, we put jobs downtown and we said our neighborhoods were only for, for houses. And I, I think some of this, the data that we saw this morning was showing like, well, we have a need for more housing downtown. There's also a lot of interest in activities and services and retail in our neighborhood centers or in our smaller city centers too. So really fascinating. And then so huge challenge there is to like, how do we rebuild our transit system in a way that serves that market as opposed to just that traditional get people in, into and out of downtown. But um, but love the work that you're doing. Um, I will stop there with comments. You've already heard a lot, a lot of great things. Um, for those that have stuck through online, we understand that there were audio wasn't perfect, but hopefully that you got a lot out of it. We'll have uh, an email out to you with links to presentations um, from this morning. I know a lot of us wanted to see that. Those of you in in house uh, probably couldn't read the very small print on some of the slides, so we'll we'll have the slides out to you. We'll also ask you a few questions or feedback about this event. Um, really appreciate you being here. And for those of you on Zoom, we'll have a short survey for Title VI um, where we ask for demographic information if you're able. So with that, um, we'll close the webinar.
and we'll invite those of you in-house to uh, join us for lunch. Thank you.